What up, my people? I'd like to welcome everybody to episode number 200 of No Hype. Joining me for the second time on No Hype is the homie Roy Miles, a.k.a. Ghetto Geppetto. Yes. So he actually was part of episode number one. He gave me all the info. He gave me the lowdown on this bad boy right here. And uh, we had a great conversation. And I said, as soon as I get the show up to being to, to doing real life interviews, I had to talk to Roy. Um, I had to do it because he's a he is a wealth of knowledge. He's been there, done that, got the T-shirt, made the T-shirt, designed the T-shirt, sold the T-shirt, still selling the T-shirts and, you know, He's an OG in the game and nothing but love and respect for my man, Roy. How you doing, bro? I'm doing very well, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. Uh, I'm so excited because you got to 200 episodes. When, you, when I first talked to you, you said, yeah, I'm going to do this every day. And I was like, oh, this dude, if he can do this, even if he does it every other day, that's it's pretty hard. But you I, really did it every day. Bro, I've Not never, just those videos. You did other videos, too. You didn't yeah. just do 200. You did 200 uh, versions of this 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 show yeah but i've seen you also i, I watch you put other stuff up as well so you're I not have. just doing that yeah i have so it's, it's commendable bro thank you it's been tough i i gotta say i've never committed to doing one thing every day for a year or any kind of amount of time like i've had consistencies working out or doing things you know right. the music but it's never been every day like you know right it's it's, it's been interesting because it's, it's bigger than a job, right? Like a job is not even every day. Yeah. Right. So it's super demanding and it's kind of it's kind of weird because like it's a goal I set on myself. So technically I have all the liberties to just not do it when it stresses me out. But Word. not doing it when it stresses me out stresses me out more than doing it every day. Right. So yeah, like because you, you built that muscle and you have yeah. to keep keep flexing that. Um yeah. And that goes for everybody who's watching this and hearing this, man. Like, yeah, you got to do this shit every day, even a little bit. That's, I mean, I work, but I also have to put a little bit into what I do every single day or else I feel like off kilter, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I guess like I'm a workaholic. You know, just, I enjoy it. I enjoy what I do. And I always have to have something like that, except I obsess over things. So like, you know, like I'm like, I'm in some mad oh, wait, you, you obsess over things. That's crazy. I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm in some mad rush to get to, you know, to get 10,000 hours and everything done. Right, 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 right. So, so um, what have you been up to in the, in the design front as of lately? Right. So lately uh, I've been really dealing with like, what is, what is social media for me and what is um, all these platforms, you know, what do they, um, what's the best move for me? Not like how people are doing it, but how should I do it? And, um, you know, I've been looking at metrics and, you know, peeping like, if I make these type of videos, then I get this sort of response. If I make this sort of, and it's like um, value proposition, you know, you, you go, well, I put this much time in this sort of video and I got this many views and comments and likes. And then I did this thing, which was half the time uh, or even less than that. And I got even more. So just really understanding the platforms, the difference between Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, and like really sort of making media, you know, like it, putting my characters in those spaces the way they are, are those spaces are intended to be used has been like the last month and a half of me doing stuff. So if you peek my Instagram, I've been even um, posting less, hmm. um, but I'm also doing more on the other side, which is like, I'm doing a longer episode for a YouTube channel. I'm launching a YouTube channel. Um, so a lot of stuff in the, in the work is there some toy stuff going on that I don't know if I can speak on entirely, but let's say, We'll be revisiting some old things very okay. soon. All right, dope. And, uh, people will be uh, uh, pleasantly surprised, I believe, uh, if, if not uh, very surprised. Um, yeah, just, and I just would think, enjoying stuff. 
yeah. I would th- I would think that like you know I have I have a bunch of these with me oh, right look now, at you. <laughs> right? And and I would think that uh, that now right because I know a lot of these were inspired and I haven't I haven't actually opened these. My homeboy uh, when I when I put out this video right and uh, one of my fellow collector friends who's now a homie of mine saw it. He actually bought the other one that I had, and oh, wow. one day he was looking for more of these. He found a bunch from like Sweden or something, and he sent them. He sent me the extras, and I thought that was super cool. But I haven't opened them yet because I've been saving them for this interview. Ah, and I remember you were telling me that you these figures were inspired by other artists, right? Because licensing at that time was super difficult. It's probably not what it is right now. Right. And also people just didn't have that sort of like, you know, like we were building a culture. So there was no such. And so like people, when they thought of toys, they thought of, you know, G.I. Joe and shit like that. So right. uh, for me to say, hey, how can I do this? You know, and, and as you know, and as hopefully the folks understand, like, Making an articulated toy at any size with variations and accessories and all that stuff is hyper expensive. And once again, I'm just a dude from East Oakland trying to make some shit happen. Um, I did and I'm on this today. So I made some shit happen. (laughs) You made some shit happen and the shit was dope. So like uh, just looking at the box, uh, the packaging of this, super, I, I love the, even just the idea of like a tube, like a cylinder, type packaging which kind of reminds me of, of firework packaging or yeah like yeah uh, yeah there's a um so it's a lot of things they're like bbs came in little cases like that if you had a bb gun when you was a kid like a bad little badass kid um the tube is also um the four not it it represents maybe the the sort of the idea of a krylon spray, spray can without trying to make a spray can but just like uh form and function of a spray can also just like uh everything was in a box and i want it to be you know i want everything to be fly and i want it to stand out you know yeah so um when i designed all that even the factory was like a tube man we can get you a box for no money at all you want to make a tube you got to have new tooling for this all this stuff and i was like make it so baby like i want it to be better and having the message there what you know on the on the box the Black Power Fist as my logo. Um, like I was really about it. You know what I mean? I'm trying, I've always been, I just want to make it like known that this is coming from a real place right off the top, you know? Uh, so it's that's dope. And it, it's those details that really make something like this special. Um, so without ever looking at these figures and to be honest with you, like I was on the hunt for the Method Man one because it's had Meth Man on Method it. Method Man, right, right. Like, I, you know, my collection, like, I don't really do too many things that are not either licensed or bootleg of my favorite artists, you know? Right. Um, but when you told me that these were inspired, that you ha- that the other guys were inspired, uh, I can't really remember who was who, but I'd like to, I'd like to take a stab at it. Yeah, open, uh, you know, see what happens when you open it. So find out. <laughs> so this one clearly is big daddy Kane. well his name is daddy right so yes uh, you know a lot of times the names aren't far off from who they are like it's no mystery there's very little mystery involved in like who the fuck these people are okay all right i mean mean? without even like uh opening one i i could tell you kid zulu is probably Mm -hmm. africa bambata yeah yeah but that's a dope name right kid zulu that that is pretty dope (laughs) this (laughs) <laughs> this dude with the boom box. Now he's, now, uh, the idea of the line at the time is that I would be doing, in my mind, I was planning on doing several series. And so that B-boy character, I plan to have in every series a different B-boy. So had you collected every thing, you would have uh, two type of B-boys, three type of B-boys, eventually an army of B-boys all in different color variations. So you could have crews of B-boys uh, and B-girls uh, that you could set against each other. Um, but I felt like that's a Puerto Rican cat. I felt like- um, Somebody from Rock City? <laughs> no, he's not, that one is not really based on a, a person, but just like the idea that 
uh, folks, Puerto Ricans were super involved in the, 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 the building of the culture. Um, and I just wanted to have somebody that represented, uh, you know, like across the board, you, you, you see, you know, all the, like we talked about the skin colors and the uh, paint, te- you know, to sort of represent the U of blackness. And um, I put, you know, C- Cubanos and Puerto Ricans and everybody, we all from the diaspora, you know, so I try to represent the skin tones, you know, I'm uh, black and Mexican, you know, Chicano and, and African, you know, so like, I wanted all that in there because all that is what makes, it's a big portion of what makes the, the culture a thing, you know? 100%. I mean, the culture started off inclusive. Right. You know? it, and I keep telling that to people. I was like, you know, the thing nobody, that's about hip hop is that it's just so, anybody can get into it. Anybody, we accept anybody into it. And I got a problem when people say that, you know, people are guests in the house of hip hop, because I feel like if you, if you, if you utter those words, you probably don't understand the creation of hip hop. You know, like when hip hop was created, of course, in the hoods, it was majority black and Hispanic, but there were white people who lived there too. And there were white people who partook in it. You know what I'm saying? And they were like, I mean, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. My mom is from Morocco, you know? uh, So like I'm, I'm mixed, but I I like that. I've always loved the idea of the inclusivity of hip hop, you know? Right. Um, well, it's, it's very uh, approachable that we, um, you know, we, if you're good, well, it used to be like this. If yeah, you're really good, if, you, if you're really good at this, we fuck with you. Exactly. You know, and there's a, you know, it's a double-edged sword because it is, you know, uh, being Moroccan and being uh, Puerto Rican and being, uh, you know, like, that's still, that's African, you know? <laughs> like, so, like, it's still yeah. black culture and, like, the roots of it are Jamaican and, you know, like of hip hop and you know, like the, the folks that are there. So like all that stuff is, it's definitely black, but like, it's not, I think a lot of folks perceive hip hop as as black culture and hip hop is not black culture. Uh, black culture is bigger than all that, right? It's bigger than just a genre of music and it's definitely bigger than the culture surrounding the genre of music. And hip hop itself, not rap music, but hip hop itself is a culture that is worldwide and has become its own thing, almost a religion. In my mind, it is my religion. Um, So like, if you accept all of it, not that you like rap music, but if you accept all of it, the DJ, the graffiti arts, or the can arts, the aerosol arts, the, the floor dancing, the dancing, the popping, the locking, all these things, which came from a lot of different places. Um, the music, the language, the style, um, the all that stuff. The yeah. fashion, um, the community, which is the biggest part, the nonviolence, that was a big portion. People got to realize hip hop came from folks being tired, folks in the community who are were young, if you look at how they were tired of folks getting killed in these gangs. They were tired of these gangs fighting. Which, so, which is which is crazy because the gang culture started to protect each other. Right, you know? right. <laughs> so, so they decided like, yo, we're going to battle, but we're going to battle with parties. You yeah. know, so like, oh, this is a culture that came from partying. You know, and if you've ever been to a party and everybody's on the same vibe, it don't matter what the people look like in the crowd. You know, and you know, as an artist, you've been all over the world and you've rocked parties and shows where the audience may not look exactly like you, but you feel the the vibe and they feel in you. Yep. So the energy, it's uh, the energy. That, you know? it's that energy. So yeah, of course, uh, hip hop is inclusive and it's for everyone. Um, but not everything is for everyone. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we got this guy here, O'Shea. Now, O'Shea. I, I can't figure out O'Shea. But, um, you know, he kind of reminds me of Joe Budden, but that's just because okay. of the beard. But I know okay, this well, is not inspired by well, Joe Budden. Well, O'Shea, uh, there's a very, yeah, there's a very famous person named O'Shea Jackson. Right. So I was going to say <laughs> Ice Cube. And if you look at all the colorways, um, they're basically, uh, you know, the, the plaid oh. and the khakis and so then the California the penal suit. 
Yeah, yeah, I could see like with the like that famous NWA um picture where he had the hat and the long like did he have curls? Did he did the cube ever have like Jerry curls? Yeah, right. He, cube had the oh, did he have Jerry curls? Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, you, I mean, because you mostly think of like Easy E with the Jerry curls, but there's some pictures with Cube with the long hair. Well, so I, I think, you know, I think I may be a little bit older than you, so I definitely think of Cube wearing the Jerry curl. As a matter of fact, um, I was um, honored, I guess, or privileged. I'd say privileged uh, to to be in the presence of Ice Cube when he came to Oakland and had cut off his Jerry curl. Uh, and he did it to be, uh, and so he cameoed in Del, Del's video, uh, Sleeping on My Couch, Del the Funky Homo Sapien, which is his cousin, and he uh, produced that album. You know, he was the executive producer, he lynch mob, Del was in the lynch mob, and so we had all the, you know, I used to hang out with Hyro pretty tough, I'm definitely part of that family, and you know, we were used to seeing Ice Cube with the Jerry Curl, you know, if you look at uh, who's the Mac and all those videos that was, you know, once he left, uh, NWA, he still had his Jerry curl for that first America KKK's most wanted album, all that. Um, so when he, I remember directly being at the music video and homeboy comes walking up the driveway with a baldy and our jaws dropped like, Holy shit. Ice Cube just cut off his Jerry curl. Like you say, Easy E was known for, but Ice Cube was equally as known for that Jerry curl. Mm. Uh, they both had Jerry curls, so it was like it was like Prince coming through bald. It was like wow, like what is happening in this world? Um, and later on, it would shift in. You would tell through his his next albums when he started messing with uh, uh, the Fruit of Nation of Islam, and Farrakhan, and his, his lyrics became distinctly more political for a while um cutting off the jerry curl was a sign of him his evolution going to the next right. level but this jerry curl ice cube man that that was a cool guy <laughs> hey he, he was a dude he, he definitely definitely had a vibe um let's see what this one is okay so yeah this is ben, this is this got to be ben Bada, right this uh, is Zulu, yes. Kid Zulu. <laughs> this, this and like uh, I, i've said this before but Okay, see, I'm missing some, yeah. there's some accessories here. Yeah, and you gotta look at the biddies, especially these biddies, um, as you can imagine uh, kids dressing up as their favorite rappers mm -hmm. or their favorite kind of rapper. And that's what I kind of looked at the biddies as. Like, they're not the actual people. These are like my versions of those people. Like what I, what I think they would be, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, knowing that there's some inspiration behind there, at least for me, like on the other end, I feel like, you know, it's it's an excuse to put them in my collection. <laughs> you right, know, right, right. it's knowing that little tidbit, you know, that little talking piece. Because you know, sometimes I feel like more than the actual figure itself, the story behind it is like to me just as important as actually owning the piece, you know. Um mm -hmm. So yeah, this this is uh this is Bam, and then I guess the other one we have is not. I don't know who not who would not be the uh, inspiration for. Uh, oh, you don't have one. Do you no. have one? No, no, no. Oh. no. This is all, this is all I got. Oh yeah, I think if you had one, it would be very obvious. But uh, what does it say about not? What's it say about his? I, you see, I wrote little 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 haikus about little poems about each I, person. Oh, are we talking about in the in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, all right, all right. So we got not every phrase is classic. Every verse was a legend. Every verse a legend. Not will twist you up in his flow. Uh, will twist you up in his flow while he lyrically assaults you. He assaults your very being. The East Coast Don. Is that Biggie? Well, he would notoriously be tying mm -hmm. you up in a knot. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. I see. So That's not. Cool. Not is my what uh, my interpretation of notorious is tying you up gotcha. in a knot. Imperial one would be Slick Rick. Yep. Okay, and that would be the the whole set. So I guess I'm missing not an imperial one. I'm missing those two. I gotta be good on luck on your good luck on your quest. <laughs> 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 I recently received. I'm gonna step off camera for a moment and okay. grab this. But I recently right. received something. I got to swear, it's over. 
Is it right there? Yeah, it's right there. Hold on. You can look at the background. I don't want to ruin the vibe of your show. There. Okay, so I I recently, know, good. I'm going to I'm going to cut I'm going to cut whatever was so I recently received a, a, a message from my homeboy. I'm going to say his name Jeremy Cole, uh, who's like, uh, you know, one of my main mans. And he was like, you know, you got a case over here, you know, you got a case of your toys over here. And I was like, Burr? you're like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah. he sent, sent it to me. So he sent me. I didn't have a master case over there, but I had a full set. Wow. So that's what they look like. Wow. I don't think you would see any of those anywhere. And I have a box up here on the wall, but not the actual all 35 units, all the colorways in the box. And so just so you'll see, this was our point of purchase. Um, you cut here because there's a perforation. Uh, yeah, perforated. You lift that, fold it back, and then it exposes all 35 units. And uh, yeah, I had never designed anything like that before. So the funny thing about this, like, since this was a solo endeavor, the factory would say like, so what kind of, what do you want on the box? And, and I'd you're say, like, oh. what I'd box? be like, hold on, man. And then like feverishly design something and like send it, send it and they're like, okay, thanks. Uh, or, uh, oh, so what do you want the uh, shipping boxes to look like? like Oh, I'll see you file tomorrow. I'll be like, oh, you know. So even I, I don't have this because I don't have like the master case, which I wish I still had. But the master case with uh, five of these boxes in it um, had messaging on the box too. They were like, you, you want to you want to print logos on the, those boxes? And all that's extra money. I was like, yes. I want when that shipping can container comes into the port of Oakland and I take them things out with my raggedy truck. I want even the dock workers to know what's, what this shit is. You know, I don't want it to know. I, and if you buy a master crate, I want you to be excited when the shit comes in the mail. You know, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff, I would assume, was just you figuring shit out because who who was there to really tell you how to do any of this stuff? Nobody. Just the, you know, once once even finding the factory, once I got all that going, they would just assume that I had things ready and I would quickly get them ready. Um, as soon as possible, you know, like, okay, hold on. How many days do I have? Okay, cool. I'll send that right away. What, when did you first have like the, the inset, like your first inception or thought to, to start a toy line? Um, I'd say that was back in 90, 99, 98. Um, when I first saw the Michael Lau stuff at a toy store in um, San Francisco, uh, it was called Heroes Club. And they, they dealt, I went there a lot all through the 90s um, and the early 80s but in the in the in that time they were like one of the stores you can go to and check out the japanese import toys and model kits mm -hmm. their specialty was vinyl vinyl model kits but towards the, the the latter part of the 90s they started bringing some wild shit in like 12 inch figures of people i never thought would have figures and uh not just bruce lee but just like uh, they were obviously like customs or one-offs and um, like high-end uh, vinyl kits that were very expensive. And then one day, I, and I didn't have money then, so I was, just, I was window shopping and just, you know, being aspirational and just digging the aesthetic. And I, one day I, I went in and they had uh, the Garden Gala figures, the Michael Lyle 12-inch figures, uh, which was his first production run of those sort of figures. And they had laptops and, you know, flocked hair and giant square heads and skater clothes and real sneakers and i was like oh i gotta give me one of these how much is this and that dude was like oh that's like uh 500 bucks each or something like that and yeah. you know there's a bunch of them and i was like oh uh nigga ain't never getting that <laughs> you know like i ain't i ain't even coming close to no, no shit like that so um i just literally every weekend i would drive out to san francisco and just look at those and you could there was no camera phones and no shit like that so i just was taking in the the vibe and the energy of that that stuff and then uh started looking up looking them up online but it really the the real thing that pushed me is i went there one time and they were gone 
And I was like, where's where's my babies? Where are they at? You know, where are the, where are the toys? It was like 12 of them or six of them. It was a lot of them. And it, they were like, oh, yeah, Robin Williams bought them. Damn. And I was like, man, I wish I was a baller like Robin Williams. I got to up my game. And it really, and I was in school at the time. And it really just put it in my head like, yo, you got to you gotta do something. And it just pushed me. And eventually, they had Eric So stuff as well. He had the Sprites kit, Sprite Kids. Have you seen those before? No. Uh, I, here's, I'll grab one here. So they had uh, these uh, Sprite kids. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. So they are, and there's variations. There's a, uh, like, mono color version and the full color version. And these were with Sprite and 7-Eleven. And the guy explained, like, you can only get these in Hong Kong. You have to go to every... 7-Eleven in Hong Kong. You got to collect these bottle caps. Then you send the bottle caps in. You send 80 bucks in and you get this thing. And it's only a couple hundred of these. And he had a whole set. And I was like, how do you do this? How do you get this stuff, bro? I like really put the dude to task. Like, bro, like, how are you doing this? And he broke out a catalog. Which I actually have that catalog around this bad boy somewhere. Because I keep up. My history is archived of this whole journey. So in this little pamphlet, I was like, it was just all these toys I'd never seen before. And mm -hmm. I was like, what is this? And he's like, there's a show in Hong Kong every quarter. All the comic book shops, all the toy shops sell their back stock at this show. And all these artists are starting to sell their own toys at this show, but you can only get them there. And I was like, I'm going to that show. I'm gonna go peep that. So as a collector at first, I just, I gotta see it. I just got, I was so fascinated by this. Meanwhile, you know, I was seeing things, magazines, remember those? I'd see like these underground magazines and people like uh, Futura would pop up and he had porcelain figures of his point man, you know? Yeah, and the stuff uh, that they I, used for the uncle stuff, right? Right, right, but they had, so the uncle figures are porcelain. They are glass. The OG ones. So you, the OG ones, which are worth a shit ton of money. And they're worth so much because not a lot of them lasted because they were not even them. They didn't even know how to make toys. So they had to make they had to find a, 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 a dishware company to make them, you know. So this right. is all very grassroots. I saw a bootleg Warriors toy set in New York. Uh, I think it was at that sir, uh, that, that store, uh, uh, sir. I think it was called. Um, and then uh, I got to the 360 toy group and, uh, you know, saw figures there from Eric So and Michael Lau. Uh So I just started drawing my own figures after that. I just started drawing characters and saying, hey. I think, I'm, uh, I, think I lost you for a second. Oh, yeah. All right, there you go. Oh, there I go. I was saying that I, I just started, like, it, it, I was always drawing because I was in school for animation. And I just started, like, thinking like, what if one of my drawings could be a toy like this? You know, uh, a couple of chat rooms started popping up on the internet and uh, that was it, man. I was like, by the time I got out of school and uh, spent some time uh, about half a year or so, maybe a little bit more in Amsterdam, uh, working for an ad agency. When I came back to America, I was like, I think I'm gonna make my own toy line. I think I'm gonna make my own toy. And so by that time it was 2000. And uh, super early in the in you know, super. So, and I, I was watching it, and there was to me, I had a fire under my 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 butt, like in my heart, because more people. I wasn't the only person discovering this stuff, and so the more I I, I saw it sort of eke out in the mainstream, and which it wasn't by the way, but I was seeing the influence start to work in the artists that I was following. So I knew like I'm in the right path because the people I considered the dopest are also either being involved in this or being influenced by it or at least peeping it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I saw a picture of Stash's studio, he'd have like a little toy in there or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. and I'd be like, and I was already a toy collector. I collect Spawn and all that McFarland yeah, stuff. You know how that is. Like when you see somebody, you're like peeping what's in their background, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, and you you're like, okay. Studio and that dude, right. he knows what's up. Yeah. He knows what's up, you know? And, uh, you know, I would see that, like, 
I would read uh, articles or watch videos about editors and animators and motion graphic designers. And I'd be like, oh shit, I got that same whoop whoop that he got, you know, like, oh yeah, I got taste or he got taste or she got taste. You know what I mean? Like we got the same taste. Uh, so yeah, by 2000, uh, end of 2000, I was already like fully like pushing towards making this happen and designing stuff and just trying to figure it out. Cause I taught myself everything. There was no, no company uh, paying for people to get toys made. There was no American format that people were doing. Um, and as by the end of 2001, I was already like, had been to Hong Kong, you know, and been to factories in China and was pushing it out. And I was able to even pay for it by just, uh, because I was out of school and a young director, I was directing music videos and I was teaching at a college and whatever money I got from the music videos would go directly into the toys. Um, and, you know, as a recording artist, the budgets were different in the early 2000s than they are even today. So you could actually make, make a small profit off a video and then put that money somewhere. So I always say I never had a nice car, but damn, well, I had my own toy line. <laughs> I had the dopest computer. Dude, I mean, that. I think that's way be way better than having a nice car, to be I honest. think so, too. Uh, me, too. <laughs> like, how much, 20 years down the line, how much are you going to talk about that nice car? Unless Bro, it was like a Lamborghini or something insane, right? Right. Like, you know, I, got the, I got the opportunity to, to teach at Pixar, at Pixar University, which was a dream of mine to even work near that company. And I taught the... Uh, the, uh, some of the folks from the Incredibles team and some of the story people. And this is, you know, right up my alley. So I got to teach them stuff. That's um, I, even like the the main producer of the Incredibles movie uh, at the time while they were like starting the Incredibles. And I drove there in the most piece of shit car that you could ever, ever drive up in. And the guy was like, can I help you? Like, <laughs> bruh, like, we don't have people driving up in no chitty chitty bang bangs like this. Like, what is this shit, bro? And I was like, oh, I'm here to, I'm a teacher. Woo, woo, woo. Man, by the time I drove there the second time, the dude was like, hey, man, can you look at my script? You know what I mean? It's not the car. It's like, you're already in the building. It's not, you are who you are and you never have to front. That's why I don't ever front. Like, that's a hip hop ethos that these fools don't really go by. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's cool to front and rap, but not in, in hip hop. I don't, I don't fuck with that. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I don't think it's cool to front anywhere. At, at anywhere. Yeah, you I, know can't, I'm saying, like, I can't relate. The culture has accepted it as yeah. it's cool yeah. to front, but it's not cool to front. Nah, not at all. So you've done stuff with McDonald's and Verizon amongst a lot of other people. What did yeah. you do for those two brands? Okay, so for McDonald's, uh, we created a... We, uh, we partnered and... I designed uh, six new characters in the form of the biddies. Uh, and they were all B boys and, and one B girl. Uh, they were for a, a online flash game uh, that was called Up All Night. I think it was to, to sort of market the idea that all the McDonald's were gonna be open late from now on, something like that. And uh, we did it with the McCain Erickson Advertising Agency. Uh, it was the first time I licensed my characters for a huge campaign like that. I had done some stuff with the, like the Method Man uh, toy came before that. But like, this was like creating new characters, not based on a person, based on my own style, based on the toy I invented. And uh, what they didn't know when they came to me, um, the, the, the photographer, Brian McC McCarty, who's a famous toy photographer, just a famous photographer, brilliant guy had taken some uh, we had collaborated and taken some photos of the biddies early on uh, and they were publishing a book and they were put in a MTV calendar and so they got around to ad agencies and art directors and so they saw the book and one of the images in the book were uh, b-boys dancing on a little piece of cardboard on uh, Hollywood Boulevard and um, <clears throat> excuse me uh, it was all forced perspective stuff so it looks pretty cool and they were like, hey, you've ever thought about animating these guys and having them? That was the initial conversation. And maybe putting them in a game? And I was like, oh, check your email. And I already had animated, we already had a CG animated version of the B-Boy breakdancing. And they, went, they lost their shit. And they were like, oh, we didn't know you could do this. I was like, look, 
I want to design the stuff for you, but we'd love to uh, animate the stuff as well. I don't really trust your team. So yeah. uh, not only did I license it, I got my crew and my production team paid to do all the back end animation work. Um, so it was a real, you know, what they call Can you call find that? Can you huh? find that? Can you find that? So that game is, you know, it's a flash game, first of all. So it's like, it, it doesn't even, it wouldn't even work anymore on the internet anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, I have it archived, but I just recently went back and like, even some of those files are just- Corrupt. Yes, yeah, it's impossible to, to read. I, I'd probably have to pay a programmer to be bring it back. And I'm not really interested in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the thing with Verizon came through the same thing. You know, like when you, the the Verizon ad was uh, a test ad for their prepaid cards. Remember, they had the prepaid mobile cards back in the day. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they what they thought? Oh, these sort of cool images of toys and stuff. Uh, so uh, once again, I designed a new bitty. This was a print campaign. Um, you know, Brian McCarty being was a great collaborator because people, his work was very seen and people saw that work and got an idea from our ideas. And so those, both of those campaigns were sort of birthed from that, like people seeing that work. Um, so yeah, the Verizon was a, a card and I don't even know if it ever came to market. Uh, I was, you know, honestly, but I was more concerned with their checks clearing. <laughs> Hey, listen, you know, look, like we got to what, do a photo shoot when you were bigger than any video shoot I ever done. Like they had caterers and shit. And we had one bitty that was a a one off sculpted thing, you know, like on top of my platform of a character I designed. And, you know, it was very lucrative for me. But um, other than that photograph, I don't have much to show from that other than the, the finances, which kept the company moving. Look, when you're in the arts and you get a check, right? And you're getting paid to do what you love. There's nothing better than that. There nah, is nah. literally nah. nothing better than that. It's probably the only reason I wake up every day to do this YouTube show because I anticipate to get paid eventually from this. Right, and right. When I get paid, whatever that dollar amount is, I'm gonna be super happy, even though I make way more money doing work that, right, that has right, nothing right. to do with this. I will be happier getting this, whatever this little check may be, than, yep. than the money I'm making. And it's because I'm doing something creative and I enjoy it. So like, I get it, bro. You're like, who cares about the, the campaign? I'm getting that check, you know? Yeah, you know, especially if it's like, um, I think that was like test market stuff. That particular time was the first time I believe I dealt with an ad agency. And so like, all that was new to me. Like I have worked in the agency, but I've never been on the client end. I've never been the, the licensor. Uh, so that was just an education. And that, a lot of times I felt like, yo, I'm getting paid to learn how to do this stuff, but also be in creative control. Um, so it was a blessing, man. And uh, But you don't get those blessings unless you put put in that work, you know. Facts. Like, take this Facts. And it's not even guaranteed, right? One of the things you told me that that stood out, and I repeat this all the time in stories, especially uh, when I when I talk about you being the first interview that I did, and, and so you you told me that one of the major reasons why you started Biddies was because there was no proper representation of mm -hmm. the culture, and we spoke about this that on our first conversation, like there were nobody was doing hip hop toys, and the people who were were doing them in other countries. Like we, it wasn't even happening here. Right, right. So I, I, could, yeah, you, yeah. could you take me back to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so like those folks that I did see, my, I'm gonna say Michael Lau and Eric So right off the top. Um, not only were they hyper influential, um, I, I recognize that Western culture in general and hip hop culture and skate culture specifically were informing uh, the feedback loop of their aesthetic, you know, like they they were looking at Western um, American skating and hip hop and taking that vibe, which is digestible across the planet, just like anybody else and interpreted it into what they thought was cool, which they were right and putting it through their work and making stuff you had not seen before. Um, and eventually the copycats around them 
I don't think they really had took the the culture the exact same way. And so you started to see, and I, you know, you've I've heard you talk about this, and I've said it many, many times. You start to see a lot of gorillas and, and, and monkeys wearing Adidas, wearing rap chains, definitely supposed to be rappers. And that shit pissed me off, man. I was like, not only do we not have no toys that look like the people that create the culture, but now we have like one of the most degrading forms of uh, racism imagery sort of slapped with our right. iconography. So I just like, nah. And if I was gonna do a toy line, um, being a collector and never stop, I've never stopped collecting, collecting toys. I've always been of the feeling that like I was never fully included into this thing from only a few characters. In G.I. Joe, you know, I was drawn to it because, you know, a stalker, you know, like he was right right there in that first line. Like I would be attracted to the characters that with some of them, one of them looks like me, even though there's 50 figures. And I was like, if I make a toy line, we, we, we ain't doing that. We're not gonna paint the character, a pink character brown. We're gonna have all the shades and we're gonna, we're gonna do it right. And if you are from the culture, you're gonna look at it and be like, yeah, that shit is legit. And if you're not, and you are a person that's melanated, you're gonna be like, oh, that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable looking at an image of myself. Um, I see myself in that, you know? Um, and that shit was super important to me. Uh, I'm so happy, so happy that now, right now, 2021, um, that's part of the conversation and that people are design, desiring these things. And over the course of the pandemic, people started to be like, hey, why aren't there these things? You know, why aren't, it's sad that it's happening now because it, you know, I'll be 50 in August and it's been my whole life, you know? I feel like honestly, the seventies may have been, there might've been more black toys than there were all throughout the eighties and nineties. I wasn't around for the seventies, but I mean, yeah, yeah, but like we spoke were, about like what yeah, was yeah, it in the seventies? I mean, you had I know I've seen um, some basket. Uh, was it a Doctor J figure, right? Some Doctor J figures. Right, there you go, Doctor J. Right, uh, Sanford and Son. Fred Sanford, you know, Red Fox figure. Yeah. Um, oh, I think you got paused up. I'll wait. Seems like we're both paused. Oh, there you go. Okay, there we go. Uh, there you go. There you go. Um, there were uh, in lines, in toy lines, there were black characters in toy lines, like uh, those sort of 12 inch big dolls. And like, I forget the name, but they were like some muscle men dolls. And, uh, but then there were like, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, yeah, I was gonna say Flip Wilson had a figure. There was a company that just started making black baby dolls. It was a black owned company out of Watts, I believe. Um, they may have had the license for like the likeness of Malcolm X and they were, uh, like I think they produced that Jimmy Walker figure, you know the dynamite figure. Uh, yeah. The the biggest star of the time in uh, commercial advertising was a guy named Rodney Allen Rippy, who was in a Jack in the Box commercial. It was a little black kid, you know, and he had dolls in a fan club, you know, like. I didn't know that. There was a lot of stuff. So, I think it started to by the time the eighties, you know, you can't. When the culture, the dominant culture, feels like it's done enough, and and the culture and the folks that aren't who are not getting enough aren't on, like aren't vigil, shit slips away. So then all of a sudden, there's nothing, right? There are no. You go to buy a black doll. There is no black doll. So your daughter can't have a black doll. Your son can't have a black doll because there isn't one, or there's only one. And then when you try to fix that boat, they're like, well, this is tokenism. We you know, we, why are you changing our thing? You know what I mean? Like, it's like. Right, or then they hit you with the, with the, um, the demographics or, the, or some kind of statistics that says that this won't do well in the market and it's not yeah, worth producing. The, but they've done zero research. You know, they're right. just, that's all numbers out of their ass. Um, and you know, well, there's a bigger conversation about supremacy and stuff like that. And, that exists. That's there. I mean, that is primarily, <laughs> you, know, you know, the thing, you know, that's that makes people want, you know, there's that great experiment that uh, great as in well-known uh, where the, I forget the name of the, the experiment where they give the 
the black child the dolls to choose from. You want the black doll or the white doll, they choose the white doll. What, which one of these dolls is the mean doll? They point to the black doll. Which one of these is ugly? They point to the black doll. Um, which one is uh, going to be smart, the white doll? Um, That's heartbreaking. It, it breaks, when you see, they, see it, it fucking kills you. And if it doesn't kill you, you really need to reevaluate yourself. Um, so I had seen that study early on and just knowing how I felt as a child and knowing that it, without, that, wasn't, that wasn't an invalid thing, you know, that I was feeling. When I was a kid, right, and I didn't realize this probably till that conversation we had when I spoke about like, yo, I went and I gravitated towards Spawn. I, you know, Spawn was a person of color. I didn't right. understand that. And then I started thinking before that, well, what was the first GI Joe snake eyes, right? Because right. I mean, he was a solid black figure. And then after that, another GI Joe that I liked was his, I forgot his, I can't remember his name, but he looked like Puerto Rican. He looked like a B-boy. He had like a, like was a, it, was like it a, a, a was it a, was it Gung Ho or Roblox or? It was one of those cats. It was okay, somebody, yeah. somebody like that, you know, and then I start thinking about like, you know, the music and, and just kind of like everything. I was a latchkey child. So like, I didn't really have my mom or dad pushing any kind of sense of pride for my culture down my throat, like most right. parents did, you know? Um, so like, I just gravitated to like what was put in, in front of me that I, that I liked. Right. And it definitely wasn't like Elvis or none of that other shit. It was like, you know, Wu-Tang. Right. And, and, and it was, right, 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 right. It, it, it was like hip hop culture. And I like, I, they spoke a language that I instantly understood. Right. right. You know? And I think and also that, you have a, 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 you know, there's a, when you talk about a character like snake eyes, they're completely masked up from head to toe. So any child can put themselves into snake eyes. Right. As, as opposed to like, not every child may think that they're Duke. And he was right. And I see, I didn't like Duke. He looked corny to me. He looked like the dude right. that like I would want to beat up. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like fuck Duke, you know, for no particular reason. I just, you know, I like Storm Shadow more than, you know. Right. Well, that, you were connected to the characters that yeah. at least seemed like plausible. Look, man, when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark the first time, I was juiced. I was probably 10 years old or something. And, you know, I'm watching this, uh, this Indiana Jones do incredible shit, you know, and I want to be like it for me. I love Indiana Jones. You gonna break when my I got heart. home I in it. the backyard, I made a whip and I was like jumping off stuff, and then I was like, wait a minute, I can't hide from the Nazis and disguise myself and punch them niggas in the face and wear their uniform and like be stealthy, and I was like, fuck, fuck. I'm standing in the backyard like fuck. Oh, shit. That's a crazy realization to have. Like, what am I going to do? And so even the non-representation entered my imaginary world. Yeah. It put up a barrier there. Um, did, did you say that you maybe got that thought process maybe from your parents at some point? Like, maybe, like, being around that? Or that was just a natural thing? You know, because I couldn't see myself. Like, right now, when you said that, you know what the first thing I pictured by Indiana Jones this white man going to save a bunch of brown kids in, in Temple of Doom. Right, right, the right. white right. savior. But I never thought uh, of that you ever know, before. You know, no, nobody never, like, that wasn't the thing. I, you know, a lot, when I was young, I would just come to realizations about a lot of stuff very early on. Like, oh, okay. I see. Same thing with, with like religion and church and stuff like that. And you just, I was uh, inquisitive, I still am. And I ask questions and if adults don't have answers for things they should have answers for, then I, would completely reject them immediately. Like, oh, that's bullshit. Thank you, appreciate that, and keep it moving. Um, I wouldn't like expound on it or tell anybody, but I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the library as a kid, um, my brother and I, so uh, we read a lot. And then by the time I got to high school, my friends were all like-minded and we're studying together, building all the time. I was getting bad grades at school, but I was getting that knowledge, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like me man like i i did piss poor in school but i learned a lot you know right. and and that was usually on my own by my own accord i did spend a lot of time in the in the in the library as well my favorite thing to do was to grab newspaper slides you know oh yeah yeah 
and and look at them and i and it was funny because even back then i was looking for hip-hop articles like right and, there were there weren't as many right no i, I there was one, one thing my I, dad used to do is cut them out he'd be like hey cut this one out for you my father was a firefighter so he'd be at the firehouse and he'd see something in the newspaper and he'd cut it out and be like hey and also like yeah i had my grandmother my grandma cora uh my father's mother she would cut out she a couple times she cut out articles about here's a person that can draw and i'm like oh thanks grandma you know like do you remember those books those drawing superhero drawing books that showed you how to draw yeah yeah I got, yeah i got one right here i got the the marble way i used to go i used to go to the library and get those all the time i i never ever was able to draw Oh, well, not that particular one. I'm familiar with that one, but there was another one. It would show you how to do like anatomy of superheroes. Like they were hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I used to get those all the time, man. Those were like, I never learned anything from those though. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I, I have to say, I have a lot of anatomy and drawing books and I, I you know, I have notes in them and from when I was in maybe fourth grade or something. Um, yeah, I learned, but you know, I ended up drawing characters with stick legs and Big giant heads. I wanted to ask you something because I, we're gonna. I'm gonna have to wrap it up in a few minutes. But I wanted to ask you something. I wanted to talk to you about Hoodfoot, and I wanted to talk to you about that process. Like you're, you know, um, on IG you call yourself Ghetto Geppetto, and you've yes. kind of evolved into like a, a puppet maker <laughs> uh, for yourself, not for hire, right? right? Uh, right. Yo, the characters are dope. Who does the beats? On the who the student the oh. production on 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 those? Uh, I got a, a couple of homies uh, and friends of friends. Uh, my man Ian Davis, uh, he sort of collects. He's sort of one of my partners, and uh, I'll say I need some beats. Um, um, my man Martin he used to be Cash Martin. Now it's Martin. Yeah, Cash Martin. Uh, he's uh, out in Austin, Texas, I believe. I could be wrong. Uh, um, J Zone, uh, you can look him up. Uh, and who else? Uh, even Jake One, you okay. know Jake One. Of course. A couple, uh, I've used his his beats. He's a uh, you know part of the circle of people I, uh, I you know I'm around or whatever. Um, and my man uh, just recently, an old cohort of mine, one of my best homies. Uh, his, his name is Montero, but his name is, uh, his real name is Dark, uh, uh, Derek Reams. He's also a producer I've known for, an MC I've known for decades. He's been giving me some beats and they were very East Oakland, like slump type beats. So I've been using those a lot just cause they kind of fit my vibe. Are you doing the, the voiceover like on the raps and stuff like that too as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't really have raps. They're mostly just like, but I heard uh, rap. There was a on on your YouTube, right? If you go to that that first video, right, 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 right. There is, a, uh, yeah, that like almost everything is is me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can I'd you, say. Can you tell? Yeah. Could you tell? Um, could you tell us about like Miss uh, Hoodfoot and and that whole that whole like movement? Yeah, yeah. Pokemon? Yeah. So Hoodland is the name of the project. Hoodfoot is the main character. He's an inner city Sasquatch. And uh, Hoodland is just sort of like uh, my my version of Oakland, uh, so it's kind of wild. Uh, Hoodfoot is a aspiring rapper that never raps, and kind of blames the world that he's not successful at being a rapper. Um, but you can't blame nobody but yourself, right? And wow. so uh, there, almost every character uh, in Hoodland, from his buddy Fuzzy uh, to his sort of like friend of me, Mr. Weeples, uh, they're all a bunch of jerks. <laughs> and really what they are is like realistic people that, uh, you know, there's, you have friends in your life that are, they never sort of grow up. And it's not just like collecting toys or whatever, but the attitude towards how they attack life, mm -hmm. it never changes. So then they become sort of like danglers, right? Like, man, you kind of shysty because you're doing shit that at 40, that you were doing when you were 15. And that's not how, you know, folks need to move. And so it's sort of that, it, it's sort of like uh, allegorical. It's like somehow, some ways, how my life I feel could have gone had I not paid more attention to other stuff. 
but also it's just fun. Oakland is funny and I'm trying to put my funny on it. Uh, you know, I, I'm a funny person. I love that. I love that clip where, uh, where, where you're like, you could turn anything into a pipe and then the fucking worm pops out. I was like, Hey, I live here. Like it's my right. home. Like, it's so, and that's aspect. another thing. So there's a meta level to that, which is it's about gentrification. So like you see in, in our hoods, like folks are like, this would be a great restaurant. And it's like, bruh, I live here. I'm with my, my grandparents grew up here. Wow. So that's what that, so every single thing you see. So there's a, deep. you got a lot of Easter. There's a layer there. under it. That is a truth. That is a reality of being a person of color in a community of color and the value or devalue of that. So and can ahead. we, when can we expect to see like, like some episodes like come, come into you? I know right, you're right. working on it. And I, I'm, yeah, like, I'm working on an episode right now. Um, uh, I won't say the name of the episode, but I'm working on an episode right now. Um, because of the pandemic, I got pushed back because then I started doing everything alone here in my studio, um, which can sometimes, you know, when you got multiple puppets to, to work at the same time, you got to one handy? Them. Huh? You have one handy, like in arms? Uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah. What do you want? All right, hold on one second. <laughs> Let's see what we can get over here. All right, let's see, make sure. Yo, that shit's- What? Crazy. What? <laughs> you call me what? What up? He just, wants to, he just wants to see what you look like. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yo, there, ain't, there, ain't no, there ain't no honeys in there. I know, it's just my partner, he just wants uh, to see you. Just me, man, I'm, I'm married. I'm not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not too fun, bro. Bye. <laughs> so like yeah he's the type of person that he, if he doesn't get anything out of you he's not fucking with you <laughs> <laughs> super dope man I really look forward to seeing uh, I see a sir slides in the background over there oh yeah 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 and uh, I actually went on your site uh, earlier okay. do you still have any of those for sale yeah yeah I just haven't had put the link up recently but uh Cause I was pushing some other stuff, but yeah, I'll, I'll be putting the, the ghost mob link up. You know, there was a thing, bro. I'm holding it like it's my baby. Uh, there was a thing, man, when, when the pandemic started, I like, I had already previous, just a few months earlier, I had already started selling the toy. Mm -hmm. And my plan was like, keep uh, a portion of them for online sales. And then the other half for conferences and conventions and in stores. And then the pandemic happened. And then I noticed a lot of my artist homies were like pushing to sell stuff and like push, push, push. And um, that, didn't, that didn't feel right to me. You know what I'm saying? Like the world was coming to a halt and all of a sudden cats would use it as a moment to, to sell. Yeah. So I just put, I put everything on pause. I had a homie like, you gotta make masks. You gotta, so I, I designed some masks and put them up there, but I didn't even push them. I just felt like I didn't want to add to I can't lie. I hopped on the mass train. I, you know, like I got a bunch of old. Yeah, yeah. You see this? This I had this sheet right before the oh, pandemic. Yes. I I did. I originally designed this. Made this design of like rappers uh, wearing jewelry and shit. Right. I I like got every like iconic rapper that I could think of and try to find them with as much jewelry. I made a collage and I was gonna print a vinyl sticker and make and just have that be my door to my office. Right. And right. I started that idea in like 2012 and like, I would just add on to and add on to it. And then like, maybe like, uh, what is it in like September before the pandemic, I went and I got it printed out into a fabric. Didn't know what I, I was going to do with the fabric. Had no idea, but I just was like, I'll get it dye sublimated and I'll, I have this thing. I had like 27 yards of it, had no idea nice. what to do with it. And then the pandemic hit and I'm like, I'll make some masks. And we made some masks, sold That's a cool. bunch. And then, um, then stop. Then I, now I have a bunch of fucking masks, you know, like <laughs> it was like a quick, quick, quick idea to happen and, and move. Right. And, right. Yeah. Um, but you can, uh, you can expect to see more stuff there. And like I said, in the beginning, it's like, uh, I'll be putting the characters, I'll be adjusting what I output with the characters to the, the platform that you see them on. 
Gotcha. So if it's on YouTube, there'll be more long course stuff. Uh, I, you know, I'll be opening some toys on YouTube too. So like, uh, I, I can't wait to see and let me know I'm down. You know, as soon as you launch that channel, let me know. Like I'm, I'm yeah, there. Yeah. Well, I, I subscribe. So if it's going to be there. I I'll appreciate be, that. And I'll be I, I just want, before I do the big, I, I've been like eating to get, you know how YouTube works. Like you get a hundred subscribers, then you can have it be the name of your thing instead of that number. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to get those hundred so I can go to the next step. Of so what's your channel? How can people subscribe right now? Anyone who's watching, make sure to subscribe to Roy's channel. So the best thing to do is just go to my Instagram and there's a link right there. Okay. And so that's at Ghetto Geppetto on Instagram. And then if you go to my profile, my bio, boom, there's a link right to my YouTube channel. And there is a greatest hits compilation on there right now. So you can watch our free cartoons. Everybody Which is free cartoons. super dope, super dope. I definitely recommend everyone go check it out. Roy, man, it was a pleasure. I would love to sit here and do this again sometime. And uh, I see you at, at 400 or 300 or 5,000. Oh my God, no. <laughs> at 365, bro, you might not see me for a while. When I hit 365, right. <laughs> I'm taking a fucking break. Yeah, I'm, you I'm, need to. You need yeah. to. Yeah, man, for sure. Well, look, thank you so much. If you have any last words for, for, the, for anyone watching, please let us know. Hey, man, just everybody be safe. Love one each another, you know what I'm saying? And be real and don't front. Also, if I'm out in Florida, I will hit you up, man. We, we can hit some swap meets or whatever. Yo, I'll, uh, I'll show you all the dope spots, bro. Yeah, yeah. All the you dope know. spots. Yeah, and uh, I got to get some of that, that, uh, <laughs> that good old-timey yeah. toys. For sure, bro, for sure. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. If I miss anything, if you want to add any sentiments to this amazing conversation, leave it in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for watching episode 200. Peace.